what I'm going to do today is, um, I think, perhaps a change of pace for you all, I um, understand, in that uh, this is really going to be pure policy, um, the talk I'm going to give you today. And um, although I'm not a partner at Energy and Environmental Economics anymore, I'm still affiliated with the firm, and I um, continue to work with them, but I um, launched a new firm with um, professional colleague, e-mobility advisors, which is really, the, our goal is to work full-time on policy to promote transportation electrification across the board. So, um, hence the E3 um, um, PowerPoint format, but um, the new title. And um, I think the other reason this is in the E3 PowerPoint format I'll mention is just a lot of what I'm going to present to you today is distilled from recent reports that um, I've worked on with E3 to share with utility clients who are always eager to understand what's going on in other parts of the country. So um, what I want to do in the um, 30 to 40 minutes that I'm going to aim to talk to you is to, um, after this quick introduction, then give a little background on the electric, electric utility industry quick primer on market and regulatory context. Then I want to talk about some of the major themes um, across states and utilities, some of the things that really, the biggest questions that they're all thinking about. And then I want to go into three, pardon me, um, five specific areas, um, which um, are very salient and talk a little bit about where states are coming together and where they're converging um, on those things. Um, now, the next question. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So electricity, electric utilities and automakers, you know, have historically existed in completely different um, worlds. Um, so, but, but the electrification of transportation is really bringing them together. And I think that there's something of an odd couple. So let me lay some groundwork to um, get to the point where you can, I think, see that. Um, first thing to understand about electric utilities in the United States is that there are a lot of them. There are something like um, um, close to 3,000 of them. In fact, on other things, I think I've even seen numbers as big as 4,000. They fall into three categories, um, investor-owned, so they're stock, they're traded on the publicly traded companies, publicly owned, which are typically um, owned and run by a city or, or a county, so like Austin, Texas, Seattle, LA, Sacramento are examples a big pub publicly owned utilities, but there's a lot of little ones. And then there's also a lot of um, cooperatives. Um, however, um, a relatively small number of investor owned utilities, um, 168 versus um, you know, nearly 3000 public ones, um, that small part of, um, small portion that's investor owned really accounts for um, most of the customers served. And you can see that in the two charts um, in the bottom left hand corner. Um, the other thing is just to give you a sense of the size of them and where our utilities fit in. Um, uh, the top, uh, the bottom right corner gives you um, some of the major utility companies in the U.S. And this is kind of old. I see it's from 2012 and there's been some more mergers since then. But the main thing to notice that um, two of the California utilities, Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, and Edison International, which is the holding company for Southern California Edison, um, they're among the top two utilities in the country. And if you actually look at, you know, sort of separate away the holding companies or um, some of the other enterprises that are sometimes wrapped up in them, PG&E and Edison are probably still the largest utilities in the U.S. So that's important to think about when we think about California. So very balkanized industry, um, but a lot of the money um, is um, in the big um, IOUs. Um, they mainly serve the big populous areas. Um, so automakers, really different kind of industry. Um, highly competitive, consumer product, um, enormous. These are all, you know, the big automakers are all, you know, global enterprises. Um, 2019 total revenue for the industry was over a trillion dollars. Um, if you look at the market cap for the top 10 companies led by Toyota and VW, um, it's huge, 200 billion for Toyota, um, 80 billion for VW. And if you look at a utility, their market cap is typically, um, you know, quite a bit smaller, particularly a lot of the ones on this chart on the right are, again, they're holding companies, so there are multiple utilities in there. Um, but if you go, like, I think the first one that's actually just a single utility is Consolidated Edison, which serves the New York City area. 
um, and then PG&E um, as of April last year, about a year ago, this, their market cap was 27 million for um, Con Ed, 22 million for PG&E. If you follow the news, you know that lots of things have happened that have caused PG&E's stock value uh, to go down. Um, so I note below that their highest market cap since 2006 was 35 million. So, you know, one utility, one big utility has about the same market cap as a, you know, as a um, good sized automaker and is dwarfed by the, you know, the biggest one. Um, and the revenue is also, if you look at like Toyota's 2019 revenues of $172 billion, compare that to PG&E's of um, about $17 billion, again, order magnitude difference. So, you know, just to put them in perspective. Um, so the other thing that's, in, and I'll, I'll come back to what the significance of some of those things are, but just bear that in mind. Um, so IOUs, investor-owned utilities, are regulated at the state level. Um, that is like the nature of the federalism for the energy industry is that really most of the regulation on all the important things occurs at the state level. The principal exception is interstate um, commerce, um, which primarily means um, regional electricity markets like PJM um, in the Mid-Atlantic region um, and um, interstate transmission. But really most other um, aspects of IOU's operation pricing, et cetera, are regulated at the state level by entities with various names, but commonly called public utility commissions or public service commissions. Um, in most states, but not all of them, PUC commissioners are nominated by the, um, uh, by the governor and typically have some sort of legislative confirmation process. That's how it works in California. Um, there are a number of states, for example, our next door neighbor, Arizona, where they're elected, and that can lead to some very bizarre um, things happening. And if anybody remembers, I'll tell you about one in the um, Q&A after the seminar and the uh, student discussion. Um, so EPA regulates smokestacks, um, but um, PUCs regulate pretty much everything else. So it's really these investor-owned utilities are local monopolies. What they have a monopoly over depends on whether or not they're in what's known as a restructured state. Um, where they're still fully vertically integrated and they handle all aspects of generation, transmission, and distribution of electricity. Um, but in any event, they're local monopolies um, and they're regulated by these state authorities. Um, okay, OEMs, um, automakers, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs um, are regulated mainly at the federal level with some delegation to the state. Now that can seem confusing in California um, and, um, and I'll explain why. So the Federal Clean Air Act is the main authority um, for um, tailpipe emissions from vehicles. And the, traditionally that's been the mileage standards set by the um, US EPA and the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration. And then I think the enforcement is largely up to the states. However, the Clean Air Act granted California the unique power to set its own stricter, pale, stri stricter tailpipe standards when it was passed back in the early 70s. And the reason for that is that um, due to um, decades of um, air quality issues in Southern California, um, our state was already regulating um, emissions from vehicles and um, generally trying to address pollution problems. And so um, California had an exemption carved out for it that allowed it to continue to have its own stricter standards in order to try to meet um, str stricter standards for vehicles and, and other things in order to meet the federal standards for various pollutants like docks and particulate matter and so on and so forth. The other interesting thing about the Clean Air Act is that I think it's section 177 allows other states to adopt California's regulations. And that has happened for a long time with its just conventional tailpipe emissions standards for, again, things like NOx. Um, and, um, but um, since California started up with its zero emission vehicle program um, 20 plus years ago, and has really been pushing for um, automakers to make and sell um, both um, battery electric and fuel cell vehicles to date, actually, I think this is incorrect. I think 10 other states have adopted the zero emission vehicle program because Colorado just joined last year. 
and both Minnesota and New Mexico are on the way. So the ZEB states amount to something like um, a third of the U.S. market for automakers, and I think it's safe to say that they, well, they really don't like that. They don't like the idea that they're selling cars. Here they are, they're global corporations, and they're selling cars in the U.S., one of their biggest markets, not their biggest market anymore. For most of them, it's China. But they're selling cars in the U.S., and there's two standards, one at the state level and one at the federal level. And when the Trump administration came in, um, and, and California and the feds had achieved, um, had converged at the time that, um, um, during when President Obama was um, in office, but um, they had converged on some pretty stringent um, mileage um, slash um, CO2 standards, tailpipe standards. And when President Trump was elected, um, some of the automakers went to him and said, you know, we really wish that you would not, you know, that you could sort of slow this whole thing down. And uh, he basically said, oh boy, will I ever. And he has, um, you know, really tried to completely reverse what happened under the Obama administration and indeed has tried to revoke California's authority to set its own standards altogether. So um, they're all off to the courts now. This will grind on for years. And I think that the automakers, some of them are probably really sorry that they ever had that conversation or, or wrote that letter to President Trump because um, now they have two standards and they have a lot of litigation before it gets sorted out. Um, so two different industries, um, one local monopolies under state sub, um, uh, supervision, primarily kind of economic regulation, um, the other um, federally regulated um, with this interesting carve out for California um, and, um, and global enterprises. So now they're coming together. Um, so um, the California Zero Emissions Vehicle Program, which is to date, mainly been enforced in California and is now um, really being picked up in other states um, and enforced actively in other states. Again, that's something if you want to know about it, I can tell you later. Um, but now we have this convergence of these two historically different and very distinct industries. And so we have guys and women who work for automakers sitting in rooms like the one in the top left, which is the, assembly, uh, the um, auditorium at the CPUC, because suddenly the CPUC and other public service commissions, uh, especially in the ZEB states, are really important venues for them because those um, the utilities, at a minimum, have to um, reinforce their distribution systems um, in order to serve what will, over time, be a pretty substantial load. Um, and many utilities um, and a lot of environmental advocates are, um, you know, eagerly, you know, banging on the door saying, you know, we would like to build not just the infrastructure, the distribution infrastructure, but we would also like to, um, in many instances, we would like to own and operate charging stations. Um, because utilities, the other thing that's important about them is, um, while automakers make money by selling cars, and even more importantly, lending money people to buy cars, lending money to people to buy cars, utilities make money by deploying infrastructure, and then they get paid a return on their infrastructure. So they like building more infrastructure. And um, moreover, what they also like is to be close to their customers and to be seen as doing things that are green, particularly in states like the ZEV states. And so for all of those reasons, we've had a number of utilities come forward to their commissions and say, you know, we would like to own and operate charging stations or we wanna be involved in this in some way. And I don't mean to make this sound nefarious. I mean, these are just what their incentives are. And, you know, there's a lot of good people who work on this and, you know, and plenty of people who just appreciate, you know, this is a new electric load and our, it's our job to serve it and we need to work out how we're gonna do it. Um, so now this is being worked out in all, you know, to some extent in almost every state now with, um, you know, three states I'm gonna talk about, gonna zero in on, you know, really being in the, Vanguard, and this is just a colossal headache for OEMs because again, here they are, they're huge global enterprises. Um, and, you know, it was bad enough that they had to deal with like, you know, the feds versus the ZEV states um, in the US. And now they've got 50 states that are each sort of deciding, well, we're gonna decide for ourselves how we should um, use our electric utilities um, to um, support transportation electrification. Um, so that is that. So that's the stage. The stage is set. So um, 
let me, so the states I'm going to talk about, I'm going to zero in on are our home state of California um, and then New York state, which is historically also a real bellwether state for um, regulation. And then Hawaii, which has really emerged in the last several years as a very interesting um, laboratory for um, energy policy and um, has kind of been a leader in some regards. So um, just very quickly, the approach, you know, we, we got started on this in like 2009 in California when the first Leafs and Volts and Tesla Model S's were heading our way. And, you know, the commission and the utilities understood that we had to start doing some things to um, accommodate that load. And the um, um, sort of the prevailing view that really kind of, I would say, governed what happened at the CPUC to the extent that you could even say it was, you know, sort of a philosophy was essentially let a thousand flowers bloom. You know, utility is going to come to us with ideas. We should let them try stuff out. We had pilots that, you know, so I call them pilots because some of them were like a hundred million dollars, which is not a pilot and really, I think, anybody's book. Um, and as a result, we had San Diego Gas and Electric wanting to own and operate charging infrastructure, you know, the whole nine yards. We had different model from San, um, Southern California Edison and the um, Los Angeles area. There was a lot of litigation. And now, 10 years on, the commission has launched a big docket that they're calling um, the Drive OIR, uh, where they're trying to work out kind of a, a comprehensive framework that they're calling the Transportation Electrification Framework. And that would culminate in the direction to the utilities to bring them plans. I'll just say briefly, there was a stakeholder mutiny when this 200 page draft TEF, as it's called, came out. And they said, this is way too much work. By the time this all gets done and litigated, it's gonna be out of date. So they're kind of back to the drawing board on how to do that. Um, New York, um, that building that looks like it should be in Moscow or maybe Stalingrad is actually the headquarters of the New York Public Utilities. Um, or it's, anyway, it's on the Capitol Mall in um, Albany. It's really a scary looking place. And they've really come at it from a much more top down um, view where it's like, you know, they've sort of told the utilities to try some stuff, but then they said like, you know, we're going to tell you what we want you to do. You know, we're going to tell you what role we're going to have. So they had a very kind of what I would call a lean stakeholder process. They had a few workshops, they got some written papers. Um, they had E3 work on a, um, um, a study for their um, companion research agency, NYSERDA, on cost and benefits. And then they put out a white paper in which they said, okay, this is how we think it should be. Um, here's our model. And then the third one is um, Hawaii, where for several years now, the Hawaiian Commission has really been saying to the utility HECO, um, you know, like basically they, they put out a decision maybe like seven, 10 years ago when solar was first becoming a big thing. And, you know, and just said like, listen, you guys, you are just from the last century, things are gonna be different now. You know, this is how we're gonna do stuff. You're gonna be more customer oriented. You're gonna be more receptive to distributed energy, distributed energy resources, including solar. And then, you know, they hammered on them several more times and they'd let HECO do a little bit around EV charging stations. They actually did a really cool pilot with um, Nissan at one point. Um, but when they came back for more, um, and this was what I would call a real pilot, very small. When they came back for more, the commission said, no, that's enough. Um, we want to see your plan. We want you to go do stakeholder outreach, and we want you to come back with a comprehensive electrification strategic roadmap that lays out your priorities for the near term, the midterm, and the long term, been out to 10 years, you know, across all the potentially electrifiable technologies. And so, I had the privilege to work on that when I was at E3 and the um, document is available if you go to E3's website or, or HECO's and I think it's still really sort of set the standard for one of, what one of these plans look like. Um, so anyway, so three of the states and then, so we'll just sort of follow them through. Um, so um, to, um, as you think about an energy regulator, really fundamentally they're, they're mainly about the money. I mean, a lot of other things have come in the picture, but um, the PUC, again, like it sets the rates and it allows the utility to collect money from its customers, to give a return to its um, shareholders and to, you know, make certain investments. That's at its core. That's really what they do. 
Um, but in places like California and a lot of the other ZEB states, um, you know, um, regulators and utilities have um, been um, pressed into service to support social and environmental goals. And, um, and none more, and, and many of these sort of come under the heading of what we call market transformation. So the idea of taking, you know, a relatively new and not yet commercial technology, um, like in the last decade, you know, renewable energy, and in the current and coming decade, um, electric vehicles, you know, transforming the market for those to make them fully commercial and, you know, and, and pump priming. So that's, you know, become a core part of the mission, certainly of the California Commission. And um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the Hawaii Commission and um, to a large extent, the New York Commission understand, you know, see themselves the same way. So they want market transformation. They want to support their states, you know, EV um, adoption and greenhouse gas mitigation goals. Um, for sure, they care about rates. Um, but the other thing they really care about when they're kind of setting the rules for like who gets to do what um, and how much the rate payers pay for is they also want competition and innovation. And, you know, they're mindful that the utility is a regulated monopoly, that it has essentially, you know, guaranteed capital recovery. And they have to somehow play this, like do this delicate balancing act to create a playing field in which you know, new entrants um, providing, um, for example, charging services can come in and carve out business models in, um, in an industry that really has no natural monopoly characteristics. You can't really say that you know, EV charging is a, is a natural monopoly like the way that you know, the wires um, portion of the utility is. So what they're trying to balance is like, well, if we have the utility do it, you know, they could go really fast and um, we could really deploy a lot of charging infrastructure and that help sell a lot of cars. But then maybe we would like snuff out these new entrants who are probably more innovative than the um, than the utilities. And really, a lot of my work and just sort of thought that I've done over the last ten years has really been around this core question. And so we're going to see how that's played out in um, in various states. Um, so the last thing I want to say is, if you sort of think about the market transformation challenge of EVs from the perspective of um, the auto um, industry, of the, you know, the environmental advocates, of, you know, generally, you know, the broader community who want to see EVs adopted. Um, we kind of came to the conclusion again in the work that we did with um, utilities and regulators at, at E3 is that it really makes sense to frame that conversation around, you know, what are the adoption barriers to EVs? And there have been study after study, a lot of good work out of, um, ICCT in San Francisco, um, but certainly not limited to them. So surveys and studies on factors that, um, you know, stand in the way of people buying cars. And typically, you know, they zero in on, you know, people just don't know that much about EVs and they're worried that they can't charge, that, that there's not enough charging infrastructure. Um, so range anxiety. Um, and, and today they still cost more than other vehicles. And there, there's some other things. And then from the utility perspective, um, you know, there's also this question of, um, you know, how do we integrate this big new load and um, into our grid, in particular, our dis distribution grid, where a charging EV can use as much electricity under cer certain circumstances as a house does today. And um, so there's that question for them. And then there's the other question, um, you know, most cars aren't driving most of the time. So can we somehow incentivize people to drive and charge their cars in a way that's advantageous to the grid and particularly helps us um, absorb solar energy. We did a lot of work um, at E3 on this, I'll, I'll mention. Um, okay, so when you think about what the utilities role will be, um, they're, really, they're really three models, although there are four shown here. So um, model number one is just basically, this is a load like any other load, it's just like a new subdivision. You, you know, the utility's job is to just provide the service connection. So all the stuff on its own system, you know, the wires, the service drop, the transformer up to the meter, you know, that's their job and that gets, you know, recovered through rates and everything else, that's up to the customer. Um, the, um, so that's, like I said, that's, that's business as usual. Um, the, um, Opposite end of the spectrum is um, what some utilities have asked their commissioners to let them do, which is full ownership. So they basically want to be, they want to both do the upgrade and then they want to offer some sort of a um, turnkey or concierge service and do 
everything on the customer side of the meter too, including owning and operating the charging infrastructure. And then case number two um, is really the in-between case, which is what's referred to as a make ready, where the utility does the upgrade on its side of the meter. And then it takes care of kind of the wiring and everything else on the customer side of the meter up to the charging station. Then the customer owns the charging station and has you know, a separate relationship with some kind of third party company like ChargePoint or EVgo. So those are the models and a lot of the fight about what the utilities role should be and what, how much ratepayer money should be spent on EV charging um, really kind of circles um, around this question of um, which of these roles does the utility play. So how's it worked out in our three states? So again, in California, we've let a thousand flowers bloom. So we've tried all the models. So Southern California, which is pictured um, on the right, um, that's a San Diego gas and electric facility. Um, they persuaded the commission to let them do this, um, to own and operate a lot of charging infrastructure, primarily at workplaces and multifamily housing um, in exchange for, um, piloting a very interesting um, time-dependent tariff design, which is actually designed to um, use EVs to, um, uh, to integrate solar power because they have more solar on their system than, than any of the other utilities. So um, at the other end of the spectrum, Sandy, uh, Southern California Edison came into the commission right from the beginning and said, you know, we just really mainly want to do make readies. Um, and, you know, we think that will, we think that will work. Um, PG&E came to the commission and said, you know, we want to do everything. And the commission said, no, <laughs> you can't. And in the end, they ended up um, getting um, a primarily make readies approved with some exceptions for disadvantaged communities. That's a DAC um, and multi-unit dwellings, which have proved to be very difficult to serve. Um, and then there, um, then there's some pilots, and there has not been a lot of utility money yet. I think PG&E is the exception, but it's really primarily a make ready that has gone into DC fast charging because there's um, um, there's cap and trade revenue, and VW um, under the settlement agreement um, has been spending a lot of money on that. So kind of a mishmash in California, but I think in this you know this docket I mentioned before, the policy docket that's happening now, they're really kind of realizing. You know that nobody nobody thinks that it's wrong to do make readies. You know, or everybody thinks it's fine to do make readies. So then it's really more about what are the circumstances in which it's, you know, acceptable for utilities to do more. Um, New York, you know, very different kettle of fish than California. You know, fully restructured state. Um, so the utilities are really principally distribution companies. Um, they. Um, um, you know, New York, it's the home of the stock market. It's just, you know, it's a very market oriented state. Um, and the commission staff under the supervision of the chair of the New York Public Service Commission um, wrote this white paper I mentioned and issued it um, in January. And they basically say, look, you know, there's no reason for utilities to be in the charging infrastructure business or charging service business at all and we don't want them in it and we think the make ready model is fine and we understand that in rural upstate areas of new york um, it's going to be difficult to deploy the network of dc fast chargers that's needed to you know give people the range confidence to say drive to montreal um, but we think there should be some sort of franchise um, arrangement for that uh, it's also the case that New York has this other pot of money. The New York Power Authority gets a lot of revenue from the big hydro plants, uh, like at Niagara Falls, and they've been spending some money on DC fast charging too. So, um, so that's kind of another reason that the utilities don't necessarily need to be tapped for that. Um, Hawaii, um, when we wrote our plan for, uh, when we helped um, Kiko write their um, transportation strategic plan, they really wanted to include in it, and so you know, and so it did. I mean, it's their plan. Um, what they called a critical backbone of chargers that they would own, and the way we described it as we want to have all this creative destruction in the charging industry, and you know, lots of innovation and competition, but we don't want people to ever feel like they're going to be stranded. So Hico should own a critical backbone. Um, so when the commission looked at this, they said, well, we, you know, we don't really know what that means. So they told HECO to go hire a consultant to come up with a model of what it is, and Navigant wrote a report, and you can read it. Um, 
I did not find it all that compelling. And I'm not sure the commission did either because they then issued a, yet another decision and they said, Let, let's just not talk about that critical backbone thing for now. Just go do some make readies and then um, and work on the buses because um, the major cities, particularly Oahu, um, want to start electrifying buses. So um, that's the that's kind of what's going on in Hawaii. So I would say in general, the trend is towards, um, you know, that the make ready is becoming the principal model. Um, it really gets the utility largely out of the business of being a charging service provider. Um, and the exceptions are going to be around um, inclusiveness for disadvantaged communities and, and um, getting into places like multifamily housing. Um, where it's just a lot harder to jack or you know jackhammer things up and so on and so forth. Where we do see different outcomes is for those publicly owned utilities where they don't have a commission to answer to and they are more kind of a tool, um, and I mean that in the best sense of the word, um, of um, typically the local city government. So you see Los Angeles Department of Water and Power being a lot more proactive. Um, um, and also see this um, to some extent in the Southeast where commissions tend to be more indulgent of what utilities want to do. Um, okay, so um, let me talk about kind of quickly go through a few of the other key um, considerations for commissioners. So California politics are such that, um, you know, it's really, really important to um, decision makers in Sacramento, to the legislature in particular, um, and very much, a, you know, on CARB's radar, the air quality board, um, that the rollout of electric vehicles cannot just benefit the wealthy people who actually buy new cars. And that, um, um, so we see, particularly in California, in these big, you know, hundred plus, you know, many hundred, multi hundred million dollar decisions authorizing uh, utility investment and charging infrastructure, you know, there are going to be percentages in there that, you know, you have to put this much in disadvantaged communities and that much in, you know, like at least this much in, you know, in multifamily housing. Um, and pg a you know, has a program that they're, um, a new program where they're going to actually do sort of like a turnkey service for low and moderate income customers. Um, now, there's a different point of view um, that we see um, more um, on the East Coast, which is, you know, it's like, look, the number of EVs that's going to find its way into low and moderate income communities is going to be really small for a while because, you know, it's really a very small segment of the U.S. population that even buys new cars. And, you know, many people in low and moderate income communities, particularly in disadvantaged communities, are buying, you know, maybe not even a secondhand car, but a third or a fourth hand car. And so it's really not a wise use of the ratepayers' money to um, be building charging infrastructure in these communities to um, serve what, you know, even if the chargers were there, would probably still be a relatively small number of cars. So the other point of view is like, look, let's just focus on um, cleaning up the emissions of the vehicles that go through those communities and are located close to them. So the ports, um, big commercial fleets, um, freeways. And so that's, you know, the New York white paper says that explicitly, like we're, you know, we're not gonna designate, you know, we're not gonna tell them to go get these things built in low income communities. We're gonna focus on cleaning up um, trucking, um, tr trucking and transit. And um, I mean, I will say California is doing both. I mean, we lead the country in terms of um, what we do with ports and transit. So, um, you know, we have a um, kind of, I'm going to have one of everything on the menu, or maybe even one, several of everything on the menu approach. But um, I think the key thing is that, um, you know, some of these more market oriented states, again, don't see it as, you know, making that much sense to put um, infrastructure in um, low income communities. Um, I'm going to skip past this because I've mainly covered it already, but I think the key thing to note is that most of the discussion about transportation electrification to date has really mainly been about light duty vehicles. I mean, when you look at like the carbon emissions, they are where almost all the action is. But if you look at the local air quality impacts, then that's all um, transit and goods movement. And um, so you, you know, you get a double whammy and that's why CARB is actually moved away, for example, from zero emission bus program, and they now call it the advanced clean transit rule, and everything else in this is an advanced clean car, advanced clean truck rule. 
So um, we will see a lot more action on that in, in all the states. And the thinking is by far the most advanced in California. Um, so I want to talk about two final things really quickly and, um, in the last five minutes, because I want to have some room for Q&A. Um, so cost-benefit analysis, this is something that has been you know, honed to a very fine point over decades at commissions like the ones in California and New York. And um, you know, new investments, for example, in energy efficiency or um, the decision about should we build this power plant or do the storage thing, they go through the cost benefit analysis ringer. And there's been a big discussion about you know, should we be you know, applying cost benefit analysis to transportation electrification um, um, investments that utilities are making with their customers' money. And um, um, San Diego Gas and Electric commissioned E3 to do a cost benefit analysis for them of um, the program that I told you about a few minutes ago. And the, I don't know if they threw it in the circular file, but nobody looked at it at the commission. They just sort of steamed ahead. They haven't really worried about cost effectiveness at all because their view is, look, this is market transformation. We're at the early stage of this market. Why would we expect these investments to be cost effective? Um, you know, we're trying to um, we're trying to accomplish something that you know is not really readily priced. Um, on the other hand, you know, with um, John Rhodes, the chair of the New York Commission, when I met with him to discuss some cost benefit analysis that we did for NYSERDA, you know, he expressed a concern that he wants to use the ratepayer dollars, ratepayers dollars wisely. Uh, and I, I mean, I do think most commissioners, including all the ones in California, feel that way as well. Um, but they leaven that wisdom with their concern about market transformation. And, you know, so he wants to be discriminating about which programs, you know, yield more benefits. Um, the Hawaii plan includes some cost benefit analysis, but again, it wasn't really something that was determinative for their commission. Um, so, but again, like the dollars have not really been big in any state yet, except for California. And some states have started to say, okay, when you come back to us utility with a, you know, a hundred thousand, uh, sorry, a hundred million dollar program or something like that, then you're really going to have to prove that it's going to generate benefits, not just for people who own EVs, um, but for the general body of ratepayers as well. And the reason that it would generate benefits for the general body of ratepayers as well is that if um, the um, charging EVs doesn't require much or any new distribution infrastructure, then you're basically recovering those fixed costs over more kilowatt hours of sales. Um, and if you do some sort of smart charging to shift the charging, you know, for example, to um, overnight, um, the wee hours, then you're going to use it even, you're going to use your fixed infrastructure even more efficiently. And you can look at these later. These are two charts I pulled out of the um, Hawaiian Electric plan. Um, but what they show is that um, from kind of a, a regional perspective, if you compare the cost of serving um, the um, EV load to um, all the benefits that are reaped um, minus the environmental benefits, the big dominant thing is this light lavender bar, which is the gasoline savings. And um, when you compare those to the cost of making electricity, it's cheaper. I'm um, um, sorry, the, 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 the lavender, yeah, the lavender is the um, avoided gasoline um, consumption. So it's cheaper, but who's getting those benefits? Well, the people who own the cars, the EVs. So the other question is, if we compare the cost of serving the load to the revenue paid in, the rates paid in by the people who own the cars, does the cost of serving them, is the cost of serving them more or less than what they pay in? And what we found in Hawaii was that it was more than what they pay in, especially again, if they're primarily charging off peak. So um, this is the kind of thing that commissioners care about, but this is the level at which this has been done so far is purely like, you know, what are the effects of EV adoption per se? The question that's not being asked is, um, although we did a little bit in New York, Question is not really being asked so much as like, but how does that compare to how much the utility wants to spend to help make this happen? Um, okay, last thing I'm going to talk about is um, so I just talked about how the benefits to the general body of ratepayers are greater um, when we have smart charging. So we shift charging to off peak hours or we put it, push it into hours when there's a surplus of solar power. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that with rates. Um, there have been a lot of creative um, rates um, experimented with around the U.S. Um, I mentioned the one that San Diego um, tried that's a time varying rate um, that um, specifically encourages charging um, at times of day when there's surplus solar. 
Um, New York um, had a pilot with a really interesting company called Fleet Karma, teamed up with Con Ed, and they did a, um, a uh, they piloted an approach that basically just paid people a reward if they went the whole month without ever charging during the on-peak hours. Um, Hawaii is, um, again, at the direction of their commission, um, at, even as we speak, um, developing um, um, EV rates that are going to have the same, I think, same goal as the, particularly the SDG&E rates to use their surplus um, solar energy. Um, when asked by clients when we um, at E3, you know, what rate did we like the best? We always pointed them to this um, San Diego gas and electric rate. Um, and the thing that we liked about it was that um, it's a three part rate. So um, there's a customer charge to just like basically what you charge, you know, pay every month to be connected and, you know, have a bill printed and sent to you. You know, then there's kind of a charge that's associated with kind of the, the total size of your footprint on the grid and that can go down. Um, um, if you um, use, um, if you, you know, spread your load out, even it out some. And then the really interesting thing on there was the marginal cost value-based um, charge, which varies by hour. So they took the California ISO day ahead prices and they said, okay, tomorrow's gonna be a high solar day. So the price is gonna be really low in the afternoon. And um, we're gonna show that to the customer in the hopes that they will choose to charge then. So um, really interesting example. Um, again, happy to provide info on all of these. So um, I will just say the main punchline from this, this slide is that when we actually looked at dynamic rates, like the one I just described versus standard time of use rates, um, the dynamic rates really provide a lot more value. Um, and that's because they pick out the days um, where it's most useful to have somebody move that they're charging around. So they provide a lot more value to the grid. And so that's, that's why we um, um, always supported those rates. So that is um, all I have to say that I have time to say, and I'm happy to take your questions. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Nancy. That was a terrific tour de force covering a uh, huge amount of uh, territory. Uh, so I'm going to try to uh, summarize a long list of uh, questions. Uh, there are several questions that kind of get out, uh, just probably viewing you as one of the world's experts on all this. Uh, of the states you've looked at, which, which ones do you think are doing the best job managing this transition? And are any of them moving as fast as you think uh, they ought to to achieve the objectives that we all have in mind. You can define who, whose objectives you you would like to use as a reference point for that. Yeah, I mean that, that's a great question, and it's a really hard question to answer because again, you um, you have to think about um, why do PUCs have the process that they have. I mean, it's all about um, collecting money from the many. Um, to pay for services that everybody uses in various ways to varying degrees. Um, I think to me, a couple of things stand out is, I mean, I like how they did it in New York because, and, and Hawaii, because both of them were, you know, the commission, I think, provided some direction to begin with. Um, and, you know, some, you know, in Hawaii, kind of like, this is what you want, these are the questions we want you to answer and how we want you to do it. And it was a pretty compact assignment. Now, Hawaii is a relatively small and uncomplicated place. You know, in New York, um, they really had a pretty lean stakeholder process and, um, you know, came out with a paper and said, okay, just file this stuff in your rate cases, you know. Um, and it took them, I think, a year and a half to write the paper because <laughs> they were busy with other stuff. So, you know, and this is a problem, you know, with regulation is that, you know, legislatures um, and regulators ambitions often exceed their means. Um, even when I worked at the California Commission, I was just blown away by the amount of paperwork and process it takes to do anything there. And I continue to believe that that's, it, it, it doesn't, like, that people can get due process without that much process. And um, so I I guess I would look at those, I, you know, I like how it's worked out in those other states. Um, so one more, uh, it's kind of a collection of many issues. It seems like a lot of the action here has to do, as, and you could it up this way, with uh, charging capacity. So uh, who should own what types of charging capacity and 
who should have access to that? You've already talked a little bit about who benefits and uh, who pays, but is there a, a general, you, you see different business models coming out where in some places, util, and you actually gave one example of utilities either could do it or not do it, OEMs could do it or not do it, municipalities could do it, uh, third parties could, uh, could own it. Any general uh, wisdom from your perspective on that? If you say you were, um, uh, and you, you may be doing this for all I know, suppose you were a VC and you were getting a bunch of um, uh, new business proposals from different people who were gonna buy and sell essentially um, uh, electricity from uh, charging capacity. And so the uh, investment would be in charging capacity which ones do you think would make the most sense or do you just need a wide range of uh, possibilities to fit the dif different uh, circumstances one finds in the different uh, states and sectors? Um, boy, that, there's a lot of questions wrapped up in that question. Um, I mean, I am a big fan of creative destruction. So, you know, it's why I really have all, you know, pushed hard in every jurisdiction where I got to talk to a regulator. I've always pushed hard for the make ready uh -huh. model because I think essentially that provides a sufficient financial foundation to enable various charging companies to try out different kinds of models for interfacing with customers and, you know, for pricing charging services. Um, or packaging up subscriptions. And um, I think that, um, it, you know, and they, they've all, I mean, I guess the other thing I'll say is that um, I also think that that free money from the, you know, from the EBSP's point of view, from the charging company's point of view, that free money has to be conditioned to some extent, you know, and that is part of what results in so much litigation is, how much it's going to be conditioned. But one of the things that I think California has done and some other commissions are thinking about is that um, there has to be some kind of interoperability. Um, if like if the ratepayers, the you know, the general body of ratepayers are going to subsidize your EV charging business, then everybody has to be able to use your station. It doesn't have to be free, but they have to have a way that they can that they can use it. And um, so, and they don't have to have a, you know, um, a keychain with 27 different RFID cards on it. They should be able to call a number or swipe a credit card or, or whatever. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's important. Um, if there's a part of that question I didn't answer that you would like me to answer, feel free okay. to re-ask it. I may, I may, uh, yeah, in a way I may do that because I'm going to parse things a, a, a little bit. Uh, there are a whole, uh, host of questions on what I would call grid integrate related grid integration yeah. issues, and I know you touched on it a little bit, but you know everything everything from is the system going to be able to take the um, increment and in total load? Is it going to be able to manage the various loads? You know between uh, you know having more renewables on, having charging, perhaps doing vehicle to grid. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, trades and so on. How how do you see that working? I, I see people for, uh, either say it's totally impossible to go very fast or we'll work it out. The whole thing will work. We don't have to worry about those are just details. If we get everything set up, if we build it, they will come yeah. effectively. How do you see that set of issues? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we really looked at a lot from a lot of different angles at E3. Um, you know, at some point, some of you have probably seen someone from E3 present on the Pathways model, which is a energy systems model of the entire economy. And yeah. I like to start there, you know, in some forums when I talk. And, you know, what that shows is that really the new, even with super aggressive adoption of EVs in California, and this would be true anywhere, um, super aggressive adoption of EVs, um, and sort of meeting the kind of energy efficiency targets we have that we pretty much have flat load at the system level all through the 2020s, you know, and that was before the COVID economic crisis hit. Um, and then it ramps up kind of gradually after 2030, because at that point, um, the new cars are very, very efficient. You know, the light weighting has been very successful and, um, and so on. So, we have never regarded it as a problem for um, the you know generation. Um, so the issue is really primarily at the distribution level. And you know, if you have a lot of cars really concentrated in a relatively small you know uh, distribution area, um, 
you know, how do you, um, how do you serve them? And I think that's the most immediate question. It's, you know, the utilities were all wringing their hands 10 years ago that they were going to have exploding transformers and, you know, no such thing has happened since then. And what they've spent to accommodate the cars that have been sold to date is pretty modest. Um, but that will become an issue going forward, but it's something that they should be able to plan for. Great. And I think there's some, you know, there's a lot of different technologies to solve that problem. Two more quick ones. If you were yeah. advising the utility, which I, it sounds like you do a lot, uh, how would you um, advise them to prioritize? You, you actually did touch on this explicitly, but didn't say too much about it. Would you go for the uh, light duty vehicles, for the uh, commercial market, for uh, municipal EV fleets? Is there anything, anything, any general guidance in that area? I mean, I think it really depends on where you are. I mean, if you're, um, I mean, first of all, everybody, it's foundational to do something for light duty vehicles, I think, unless you're, you know, exclusively serve, you know, an area where people just don't have, you know, if you're like a rural co-op in Montana, that should probably not be your priority. But if there's like a meatpacking plant that, you know, trucks go in and out of all the time, um, in school, then maybe you should think about the trucks. Um, but if you're, you know, the way they looked at it for clients is, you know, beyond light, you know, light duty, um, then what are the major, um, uh, you know, commercial and industrial transportation related loads in your community? You know, has your transit agency decided that they want to electrify their fleet? Um, or, um, you know, do you have big, you know, multimodal depots or a port or, you know, so I think there it's all very, you know, very location specific and you really need a custom assessment. One last question that's come up in many of the seminars this quarter from totally different uh, angles is once you start down the EV road, um, how long before, um, surprise, surprise, it turns out that fuel cell electric ve vehicles are actually an even better idea? Right. And you, I guess for you, do, do you feel the system has been set up a way in a way that kind of compromises, it's kind of a path, a, a lock-in pathway problem. Um, do you think the current initiatives could uh, kind of fit uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or we need something else or are we making, you know, uh, investments that we'll regret because we should have known that the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles would ultimately beat out the uh, EVs? How, how do you come out on that set of issues? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. I mean, um, you know, the Airboard has really gone out of their way for years, you know, to um, call, you know, call it a zero emission vehicle program, to have a fuel cell path to compliance. You know, they really wanted to figure out a way to finance the, you know, charging or the um, hydrogen refueling network um for cars um they thought they were going to use the low carbon fuel standard to get the refiners to pay for it but that didn't happen and you know there's a modest number of stations in california and really no place else and that i think has led all of the major oems to just think well we got to have an electric player in the game my understanding though is that the bigger factor is actually in china where they've really gone heavily, you know, electric, and um, that that you know that's really the tail that's wagging the or it's the dog that's we're the tail, they're the dog. Uh, Great. Uh, well, uh, thanks for a terrific seminar and for answering all these questions so skillfully. I think you just proved my um, uh, my hypothesis that you're one of the few people alive who actually can play three dimensional chess while roller skating. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks Only again. Only John. Uh, we'll, look, we'll look for you on campus here, with, particularly with the Bits and Pros, uh, Watts program down the road as soon as we're all cleared to travel. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot.